Good afternoon, everybody. It is Tuesday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner, digital sports producer for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I am joined today by Travis Sawchick of The Score to talk about the collapse of AT&T Sportsnet and how it might impact the Pirates and Penguins. I think this is the biggest story in local sports right now. Um, you know, we can talk about the Penguins trade deadline. We can talk about Pirates spring training, but but the long term impact on these teams could be profound, and and that's why I think it's it's really important to talk to someone like Travis, who you might know primarily from uh, his days as a Pirates beat writer for the Pittsburgh Tribune Review. I think it's going to be going on ten years ago, Travis. That uh, you and I, I was I was an intern. You were the Pirates beat writer. I don't know if you remember me working at the trip with you, uh, but that's uh, ten years ago, twenty thirteen, I believe. Wow, where do, where does the time go, Adam? But it's, I, it's wild, but uh, it's, I know, it's right? great to be with you and back uh, speaking with a, a Pittsburgh sports audience. I had a, I had a blast uh, during my time covering the Pirates in Pittsburgh. Absolutely, but now you've you've gone on to you know bigger things. I, I believe you've written a book, Big Data Baseball, that that was a big smash hit. Um, you know, based on your time covering the Pirates, and now you uh, work for the Score, and you've done a lot of reporting on. Uh, you know, local sports television rights, which is what we're talking about today. Um, it, you know, and, and if you're just catching up on the news, we learned late last week that AT&T Sportsnet uh, looks like it is going out of business. Its parent company, Warner Brothers Discovery, um, has told teams, including the Pirates and Penguins, um, and a handful of other teams in Seattle, Denver, um, that, that also have AT&T Sportsnet branding, that it intends to get out of the regional sports business. Um, that it set a deadline of March 31st for those teams to reclaim their television rights and, you know, presumably uh, broker new deals with other television providers. Um, so, Travis, my first question for you is, is how did we get here and, and what impacted the unbundling of cable? Uh, you know, people going from having cable to just using streaming services like YouTube TV or uh, you know other things. To what extent is that responsible for why we're having this conversation about AT and T Sportsnet going away? Yeah, it's it's you hit on it. It's part of the the cord cutting trend, and you it's disrupting what's been the bedrock of local revenue, the, the and often the li the lion's share of local revenue for teams for going on four decades. Back when yeah you know, the new island the new York the New York Islanders and Cablevision started all this. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, back when, you know, owners didn't, they feared putting their local product on TV and what it would mean for the gate. The Islanders, uh, Cablevision was just starting out in New York, and they thought, well, let's try to expand our audience and put it on, on cable. And that, uh, they went on the basic cable tier, it was successful, and that created the model where most of these RSNs were put on local cable tiers, or maybe the next tier up, and, uh, subscriber the fees were kind of buried in a cable bill so everyone who subscribed to cable paid in uh, but most don't watch live sports i mean most people don't watch any particular channel but most people aren't watching but yet they're paying and you know as cable grew over the years the rights fees grew the revenues grew and it was great for franchise values for owners revenues for player salaries uh, but what happens when the trend shifts and people start cutting the cord and there those rs those fees decline uh, because the the rights fees, what the RSNs have paid for the right to broadcast these games are flat, but you have fewer people supporting, um, paying in. So, you know, 2014 was peak cable and there were 100 million subscribers, uh, paid subscribers in the US. And at the end of last year, it was down to 70 million. So it's a 30% decline in eight years. But it's also accelerating. I mean, Comcast, the largest U.S. cable provider, reported an 11 percent year-over-year decline in cable customers. So you can see that uh, the, the angle of decline is steepening, which has to be really troubling for for anyone involved in this. And uh, you know, we saw the news with AT&T, and then you have the Bally Sports, which holds rights to 19 regional sports networks, 14 more MLB clubs. So you combine that with the, the four AT&T clubs and you have more than half the league with, un, as we approach opening day, uncertainty, you know, uh, will we be paid? Who, who's going to, they have no idea what is going on with the lion's share of their local uh, media revenue. And that's, yeah, uh, customers have choice now. And 
more and more people don't watch cable enough to warrant paying. And uh, we've seen cable bills have kept increasing. I know just where I'm in Cleveland now, I, I cut the cord a few years ago and I went to Hulu, which had an RSN at the time, uh, but they couldn't work out a deal. So then I hopped to direct TV streaming, which is the only local carrier that had an RSN. But I noticed just in the two years of uh, maybe a year and a half of having it, my bill increased three times. And I have to believe it's because as fewer people support subscribe, uh, the, the bill goes up and it's not just, it, this is linear, this is streaming cable, but uh, the general idea is the same. Fewer people support the overall, fewer subscribers mean fewer people are carrying on the, the overall bill. Uh, so that's a long rambling way of where we are, but that's where we are. And that's why we're seeing this crisis play out. And I think you're right to say it is, it's the biggest locals, it's the biggest national sports business story, maybe just sports story right now is the whole model is being disrupted. Yeah, and that's kind of what I wanted to ask you about because I think the po- I, I don't think people realize because we've been talking for Bally Sports I think for about a month and and their possible bankruptcy. Um, I don't think people are necessarily making the delineation between what's happening with Warner Brothers Discovery and what's happening with uh, Bally Sports, Diamond Sports, uh, which which is the parent company there. Um, but what's happening with the Pirates and Penguins is their TV provider is getting out, and, and they're not they do not have a local home. These Bally Sports. Uh, teams in like I think about 14 markets uh, you know some of them have multiple teams some of them don't but I think it maxes out at around 14 markets um, I, I believe in their bankruptcy if I'm if I'm correct um, Travis that they're planning to try to reorganize and try to hold on to these uh, you know regional sports networks and these television deals with with local teams um, but that's not true with the Penguins and the Pirates um, and they've guaranteed that, you know, at least the Pirates have, that their their games will continue to be on television. But I think the question of the games being available is also different than whether it's going to be profitable for them in the same way that it was under the RSN, you know, here in the short term. So, um, you know, Travis, where would you expect, I guess, the, the games to show up uh, come, you know, the end of, of March? And, and to what extent are they going to be making the money that they're used to making from that? Yeah, great questions. And there is a the game. First of all, the games will be broadcast. I think even Rob Manfred, the MLB commissioner, said last week to reporters that uh, teams who do have the have their rights, you know, disrupted or redistributed, there will be an MLB TV option where there will be a local option. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's the out of market streaming platform. So they will add at the in-market game there for an increased price. Uh, that's the plan on the digital side. And then Manfred said they'll also, uh, MLB and the individual clubs work with, you know, directly with cable providers to try to find a new cable home uh, in market. And that's up in the air. We don't know what that looks like. I, I think I read a report or two that where the Pirates and Penguins might try to work together to kind of recreate the bon- bundle on their own uh, locally. But, it's not going to be for the same price. I mean, even Manfred said, uh, at least short term, the whatever follows this for the AT and T holder, those tied to AT and T or Bally, we'll see how that plays out. It won't be a uh, dollar for dollar the same revenues. It'll be it'll be less. And Sports Business Journal had a report yesterday. Uh, they they spoke to some NBA executives and I think some MLB executives too, and. The estimates were up to, you know, it could be a 70% loss in local uh, TV revenue and go in from what was existing before to what comes next for these affected clubs. And that is significant. I mean, uh, maybe it's just short-term pain, but <laughs> is, again, so player salaries, franchise values are all tied to, uh, to what the model was, getting the game subs- viewers subsidizing these games through cable and that's being disrupted and it, these teams will take a hit i think the games will i'd be surprised if games weren't available to fans in, in some capacity on cable uh they should be on streaming but uh what owners recoup for those <laughs> that whatever the new model is it, it will be less at least in the short term 
Yeah, I think of, um, you know, I know 20 to the point is one of those obscure cable channels that we have in Pittsburgh um, that, you know, has they have Riverhounds games. I, I, I look at that as potentially a place that, that um, you know, local sports teams could land. Um, Travis, I want to get into a little bit why it's not as simple as, oh, we can just have, you know, MLB stream the games for the Pirates and that will that'll make everything OK, like it, because it's, it's more complicated than just saying, you know, I, a sports fan, want to just subscribe to MLB.tv for whatever a month, and that's going to replace the Pirates' revenue. I think that's goes to what we're talking about with the unbundling, which is you're not – yeah yes, you and I and sports consumers can still pay to watch the games if we want to, but we're not going to replace all that value of all the people who weren't watching those games, A. And I think the Penguins and Pirates and why it's important – whether they work together or not, is that um, not everyone who watches the Pirates watches the Penguins, and not everyone who watches the Penguins watches the Pirates. But for the bundle purposes, anyone who wanted to watch one of them functionally served as a fan of both teams, right? Because you're paying, you know, if I'm a Penguins fan, I'm paying for cable to watch the Penguins. Well, the Pirates are getting a cut of that too, and vice versa. Um, Isn't that why this is more complicated than just, oh, we, we can get the games on streaming um, you know, the, but the teams won't be able to replace that revenue, right? Yeah, it changes. If it becomes more of a direct-to-consumer model, like a Netflix or Disney+, Plus, where you are having to compel people to sign up, there's, there's going to be a lot fewer people. And the price point to replicate uh, what you had from the cable model to a direct-to-consumer model uh, it would be, it would have to be much more. I mean, it, it would have to be <laughs> instead of like seven or eight dollars a month for your RSN to, for teams to have the same revenue from a smaller audience. It would probably have to be like fifty or sixty dollars a month, which isn't going to happen. Uh, I mean, just look at ESPN. You know, they they had a hundred million cable subs, probably down to seventy million or so. Uh, but ESPN Plus, their streaming option, you know, they they have far fewer people signing up for that, and. Uh, so you're not replacing one, one paying customer for one paying customer. Uh, you're, repl- you're losing, in this model, you're probably going from five customers paying in, probably four of it, which were you know, not watching, to that one person paying to watch. So you can see why this has to be terrifying to club owner- owners. If it's a direct-to-consumer model, you have to compel people to watch. You can't go through a multi-year rebuild period if you're alone uh if say the pirates and penguins couldn't bundle together if you're the pirates you can't have multiple hundred loss seasons stacked on top of each other because how many people are willing to to pay up for that i would think would be a pretty pretty low number so i think that's why you're going to see them uh try to recreate the bundle locally on cable but as for did we'll have to see how it plays out digitally like if the in market, if let's say all these eighteen clubs that are affected in some way or another band together and they are all they have an in market option on MLB.tv. Well, how are those revenues shared? Is it just an even split like MLB.tv is for out of market games, or are they able to geolocate where the subscribers are and those those revenues just go to the in market clubs? I I'm not sure how that works out, but you can see how there's this whole question of the revenue share if it does become more of a collective where the leagues run and control more of the, uh, the in-market revenues. Uh, so uh, yeah, to your que- I hope that covers most of your question, but I think, yeah, yeah, it goes from this kind of passive model to an active one where you have to, you have to compel people to sign up and you have to keep them because the churn rates in the streaming space are pretty significant. It's easier to cancel you often don't have to call up customer service and wait on hold for 30 minutes and explain why you're cutting. You can just click the button and you're done. You have to compel people to stay on. And most streaming operations to date are not profitable. I think Netflix is the only one and they've been around. Uh, I mean, I was getting Netflix DVDs in the mail. So I've, I've been around from the early Netflix days. Uh, but Disney Plus still isn't profitable. Peacock is bleeding millions upon millions of dollars every quarter as these industries try to ramp up. So you can see how this, it's just so significant in so many ways. 
I did want to ask about the streaming services because, uh, you know, to the extent that I can imagine something new, I mean, that seems like potentially the new bundle, right? Is, is you know, if I like Apple TV because I like watching Ted Lasso, it's my girlfriend's favorite show. She's, she's fired up for that show coming back. Um, you know, but I can just watch Ted Lasso and then unsubscribe from Apple TV. So the streaming services do have some incentive here to try to buy some loyalty from consumers, right? Um, in that, you know, if I subscribe to Apple TV to watch the Penguins and the Pirates, I'm not going to cancel that after I watch one 10 episode season of a show that I want to check out. Um, to, to what extent do you think it's possible that the Pirates and Penguins could end up on an Apple TV for that reason, in, in that they're trying to buy loyalty? Um, and, and that this might be, you know, these these WBD um, RSNs, you know, these teams that are losing their home could kind of be their way of getting into that local sports market without having to just say, oh, we're going to distribute all MLB games. This is kind of just starting small a, as a foothold for them. To what extent do you think that's possible? Yeah, these – I mean, you mentioned Apple TV, and what they've done with MLS is really interesting where they've – created kind of this one-stop a Netflix for Major League Soccer. And every game, I don't think there's any blackouts, blackouts. It's all on the Apple TV Plus app this year. And I think that's going to be, if you're a soccer fan, if you're an MLS fan, that's great. And I think down the road, every major, well, the NFL is its own animal that's really not affected by this. Uh, they're in such a great position and they're not dealing with RSNs. But I think down the road, uh, you know, the NBA, NHL, Major League Baseball, they would love for a third-party distri uh, distributor to come in and, again, cut them those guaranteed checks that they're accustomed to for the last four decades, uh, provide the distribution, provide the guaranteed check. And it could be consumer-friendly, too, if Apple TV was picking up most of your baseball or uh, NHL games. That would, that would be great. And maybe we'll get there. Uh, I don't know... We haven't, we've seen Google with YouTube TV. We've seen Amazon with Thursday Night Football be really interested in the NFL. And they've picked up, they've bought, they paid billions for certain packages. And there's expected to be a pretty big bid, bidding war when uh, the NBA's national rights come up amongst the streamers and the traditional players. We haven't seen, like Major League Baseball replaced its ESPN package, uh, its midweek ESPN package last year to a combination of a new deal with ESPN for much less, like 60% less inventory and Apple TV and Peacock were both involved. But the streamers didn't show like a ton of interest in that deal that the overall value is a little less than what the previous ESPN deal was. So uh, will there be a third party? Will there be a big tech giant that enters as a savior for these local rights as a distributor like Apple TV? I, I don't know. We haven't seen it yet, but we're still early on and there's incentive for them to, for Apple TV to grow its audience and try to catch up with Disney plus and Netflix and Amazon and Google are all involved. So there, there are big players involved and down the road, maybe they'll control more and more of those rights, but in the short term, it might, they might not rise up. It might have to be, they go to the ML, ML major league baseball has to go to the MLB uh, TV model for, for local rights. So. Uh, I don't know if that quite answers your question, but I think uh, the, the 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 knight on the white horse is the third, third is a tech giant coming in for the, for these leagues. Yeah, I think it does answer my question. I guess the question is, what do you see as long term and short term? I I think a lot of people are looking at this as you know, baseball season's about to start. You're probably going to have for 2023 one of these to 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 the extent that I understand it, that's the short term. What do you view as the short term, I guess, is, is the better question, is what, what happens for 24, 25, 26? Do you consider that longer term, or could this be a multi-season thing for the Pirates where they are in this kind of weird limbo and, and don't really have a permanent home? They're just kind of renting, I guess, to use a, a, yeah. a different yeah. term. Uh, I do think MLB.TV – I call it MLB.TV Plus, where you include the local option. I think on the streaming side, that could be a long-term – uh, answer where instead of a third instead of Google or Apple or Amazon saving the day, Major League Baseball has to, on the streaming side just has to keep most of their local content there because I don't know that the tech giants seem to want big audiences. Amazon wants Thursday Night Football. Uh, you know, 
Google now has a Sunday t- Sunday ticket package for all everyone watching the out of market NFL games. They want those huge audiences where you know weekday weeknight baseball doesn't really deliver that. Maybe collectively it w- would, but in individual markets it doesn't. So I don't know. I I do think teams will squeeze out every last dollar of the cable model. And I to your renting point, I think we'll, we might see the Pirates and Penguins potentially like bouncing around to different stops over the next few years. Who's willing to house them? Uh, because I don't think they'd want to lo- sign any long-term deal that's well below what they're previously earning right now for the cable side. So maybe we see some shorter-term deals. Uh, but again, with the cable side, I mean, if you just look at the trend, we've gone from 100 million in 2014 to 70 million this year. The trend is accelerating. And it's not just people leaving, it's ad dollars. Ad dollars are migrating because the return on investment through connected TV is better. Uh, you get, Advertisers get more information when you're streaming your video versus the blind dart throw that's traditional cable. So they're migrating too. So, you know, by the end of the decade, I don't even know what, you know, how cable is going to hold up. I will we'll have to see, but I, I think, yeah, long term, I do think like the MLB TV option, something similar for NBA, NHL could be the option. Uh, and as the cable model kind of winds down, but for people worried about seeing games, I don't, you'll have a platform to see it. I think this is more a concern on the revenue side for players and owners. Yeah, I think that segues now well into my next question, which is, you know, there's been a lot of talk locally uh, about the Pirates potentially extending Brian Reynolds, holding on to him. Um, he's their, you know, their best player, their biggest name. Um, is that given given where we are with AT and T Sportsnet, just pie in the sky type of stuff um, to be talking about potentially signing, you know, a, an extension that could be in the neighborhood of a hundred million? when you don't know where that hundred million is coming from. Yeah. I mean, the, the pirates don't have a history of handing out too many lucrative contracts. And you would think this certainly complicates matters when you, if you're losing say 70% of your local TV revenue this year, uh, I mean, you can argue every owner is rich enough to afford any single contract, but a lot of these owners operate as businessmen who don't want to, who are concerned about their margins and you know don't want to lose money. I mean, you have you have outliers, perhaps like in San Diego right now. Uh, but yeah, it, it reduces the chances. I I wouldn't put it a zero chance, but I, I it has uh, it has to reduce those chances. You would think uh, just from you know my position on the outside looking in and looking at those dollars uh, really in question as the season opens. Yeah, I think especially it's the uncertainty too. It's not just will this, you know, you would expect some money might be there at some point, but you don't know where it's coming from right now. So to sign a contract without that, without any understanding where you're going to be next year, to me seems crazy. And, and you know, we can keep talking about it, but it just doesn't seem likely when you, you don't have a television partner past the end of next month. Um, the other question I had for you was, I guess, more with regard to the Penguins, um, you know, if, if they take a 70% hit. Is it possible that they could be forced to, because this is a city, you know, with, with the Penguins, there's been economic issues for them in the past. They declared bankruptcy. They had to get rid of some very big name players um, in the early aughts, Yarmir Yager, Alexei Kovalev. Uh, those guys got shipped out of town, not because, you know, the, the Penguins didn't want to hold on to them, but because they couldn't afford them. Um, you know, is it possible that we could see the Penguins trading of getting Malkin or Chris Letang? Uh, because, you know, not because they want to, but because they're taking this hit in local revenue and they they simply can't afford those big contracts anymore. Yeah, uh, I would think that could be the case. The NHL is kind of outside my area of you know, expertise. Uh, but yeah, you would, you would think anytime you lose a significant portion of your, your revenues, you, these owners are going to trim elsewhere and player payroll is their greatest expense. And uh, unless they have some huge debt obligation with a stadium construction project or something like that. So uh, yeah, you would, you would think situations like that would play out across the league uh, and certain markets might be more affected than others. Uh, Pittsburgh does have a very loyal sports uh, audience and fan base. So maybe there would be uh, say there's a direct consumer product that the teams, you know, earn direct revenue from, 
maybe they'd be supported more than another market in say Tampa or, or Miami for baseball or something like that. So maybe it wouldn't be 70%, but if, but if it is that number, uh, yeah, it, you would think player payrolls would have to come down and certain trades of players uh, would be possible. Yeah, I think that's a, a terrifying possibility for for Penguins fans, especially who we were just excited a year ago that the the Penguins extended those those legendary players who've won three Stanley Cups here. Uh, I, yeah, I think the potential saving grace, Travis, is that Fenway Sports Group does have pretty deep pockets. They own a bunch of sports teams, um, you know, and I'm not sure if getting Malkin's six million dollar contract is necessarily going to send anything into a tailspin. So, you know, if I you know I don't want to scare Penguins fans, I would be optimistic that they would try to honor those deals because they, you know, that that's the benefit of being part of a large ownership group is that there are some deep pockets here compared to the days when, you know, Mario Lemieux was forced to buy the team because the team owed him so much money. Like the, the, we've, we've come a long way since the two thousands in, in terms of, of who owns sports teams and, and how much they can take hits. But, you know, I think over the long run, it is a worthy question worth asking. Um, Travis, are, are, are there any final thoughts you have about, you know, where we are and where we're going. And, you know, if you're a Pirates or Penguins fan, I guess maybe scale of one to 10, you know, how how concerned should you be at this moment, given the state of play? Uh, yeah, and just to follow up on that last question real quick, uh, on the flip side, if you're trying to compel people to buy your subscription plan, you might want to keep your star players around too. So if you shed all your star players, you're going to have even fewer people signing up. So uh, in that hypothetical world, it, it would be fa- it's fascinating to see how that play, would play out. But yeah, I think it, it is. It's a. I think it's a especially scary time if you're running the club. Uh, but long term, I think this is actually really exciting, especially if you're, if you're on the consumer side. If you're a fan, it's going to force teams, I think, to be more competitive because you cannot string uh, these terrible seasons together and just tank uh, for high draft picks as often. I think it's going to force broadcasts to be innovative. You think about how we watch games. It really hasn't changed. We still have the center field camera angle in baseball. Uh, we, you know, the the rep, How we watch the camera angles, how games are broadcast and presented haven't changed much. I think there's uh, chances to do some interesting things there. And it's just, you know, the consumer's going to have more, the fans going to have more say. If we don't like the product, if we don't like what you're doing, we are not going to subscribe and it's no longer subsidized by people who are, who are not watching. And you think about most businesses, usually it's, they, you produce a product and it has, it has to appeal to a certain customer customer base to make it work and uh, you know, be relevant to, to support the model. So I think transitioning to something more like that is long-term going to be healthy. And I think we're going to end up with fewer a blackout down the road, uh, especially as we, I think something like the MLS Apple TV model could work for other leagues. And I think down the road, maybe not in the short term, it is going to be more, more consumer friendly. We might need more subscription plans. Uh, I hope, uh, but I hope we get some consolidation in that space too. So uh, yeah, I, I don't think fans should worry too much. I mean, there could be some short term things, players traded, that sort of thing, but uh, we'll be able to, I'm, I'm fairly confident we'll be able to watch the games. And I think the future is, is exciting for what it means for choice and pre- presentation and uh, competition on the field. Yeah, I think that's an important point worth making is that if the, if the teams do have to compete for your dollars, the, the model the Pirates use probably hasn't, you know, probably isn't worthy. And you are going to have to start, you know, competing harder to, to get those eyeballs, um, especially if the Penguins and Pirates aren't on the same um, you know, if they're not in on the same deal, because at that point they're competing for eyeballs and the pirates are going to have to on a night when the penguins are in the playoffs, the pirates are going to have to provide a reason to watch. And, and I think that'll be interesting to watch play out. Um, Travis, thanks so much for joining me. I, I, I think your expertise in this space is, is really appreciated because there's not a ton of people who, who really saw this coming. I think you wrote a big, a big set of stories a year ago because you did, um, so kudos for that. Is there anything you'd like to promote or let people know how they can uh, connect with you? Uh, yeah, it's well. It's great to be on with a, a Pittsburgh journalist here <laughs> again to reach that reach a Pittsburgh audience again. So thanks for having me on, Adam. And yeah, just check out the Score app. Even if you don't want to read uh, my MLB features, we have great. I think uh, 
our box score set up there is is the best for just pursuing scores and and news and alerts. So it is a really good app and ecosystem to be in if, for your sports media needs. So check us out in the score. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Travis. Uh, we'll be back on Wednesday with the North Shore Drive. I believe Chris Carter will be live from the NFL Combine in Indianapolis. Um, if you're just joining us for the first time, please pop a like on this video. Help us out with the YouTube algorithm. Please subscribe to our channel so you don't miss anything. Like I said, Chris is going to be at the NFL Combine. Ray Fittipato, Jerry Dulac are there. Um, I think Chris is going to try to have some players interviews with some players, uh, maybe some executives. So uh, you know, keep your eyes peeled for that. And of course, please check out the subscription deal down in the description. Six dollars for six months of access to PostGazette.com. Um, great deal that'll get you up to the start of MLB season. It'll get you through the NFL draft. So make sure you're checking that out. Travis, thanks for joining me, and we'll talk to you all again soon. Thanks. For Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you liked the video, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it on Apple Podcasts, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down in the description.